Okay, so um, yeah, the session this morning is Literacy in Students with Visual Impairments. And um, just to introduce ourselves, my name is Glenda Parsons, and I am the Director of Programs for Students who are Blind or Visually Impaired with APSI, the Atlantic Province of Special Education Authority. Um, and I've been in education for many years, 34 years. So most of my career or half of my career is in the classroom setting. And then I've been working with students as an itinerant teacher and for the last number of years working in administration. And Nellie, you want to quickly introduce yourself? So, and I'm Nellie Van Cly, and I also work at APSI. I'm the provincial supervisor here in Nova Scotia, I'm supporting the itinerants and students who have uh, visual impairments in the province. And I also, um, my career is about 30 years, not quite 30 years, but close to 30 years, and I started as a classroom teacher. So the majority of my teaching experience is definitely in the classroom. And then I worked as an itinerant teacher supporting um, children with visual impairments. And now I'm in an administrative role, but I'm always excited to be able to come into the schools and support itinerants and classroom teachers and the students. Thank you. And for both of us, what we find valuable is our classroom experience and how that links and helps us get a better sense for literacy and reading and writing and just learning in general for students who are blind and visually impaired and, and what that looks like looks like and is it different or not or how do you make it work so that's a valuable component so the first thing we thought we would do is just give you an idea a, just a general sense we see here my page is not turning let me see here oh there it is oh yeah these are objectives so you can just quickly look through those we're going to give you um, just a quick introduction to APSI. We're not sure how familiar you are with it. Um, and also, um, also you'll, re you'll recognize in the end how comparable literacy for students who are blind and visually impaired is compared to students in the classroom. And I will reference when we're talking about um, these particular students, these would be students who are following the general curriculum comparable to their peers. They're on a regular typical screen. Um, within the, the general norm range of uh, cognitive development. Um, also getting a sense for the role that the itinerant teacher plays and that they are part of the school-based team. <clears throat> we do have some guidelines to show you. And we'll also want to discuss some of the factors that could impact um, the reading and writing process specifically um, for students who are blind or visually impaired. <clears throat> So first of all, what is APSI? <clears throat> we, the APSI stands for the Atlantic Province of Special Education Authority. And we are an organization, we're funded by the four Atlantic provinces. And uh, we do have staff in all four provinces. Newfoundland and Labrador are just a very, very small number, but um, for the most part, we, we are um, very, very active in the three maritime provinces and giving a significant amount of support to those in Newfoundland and Labrador. So that's how we, we function. And so for me as director, I'm responsible for programming in all four provinces, whereas Nellie is one of the supervisors for the province of Nova Scotia. We do have a website. So we uh, welcome you to um, visit our website as often as possible because we're putting up new ideas and, and components on a regular basis. And also we encourage you to follow us on Twitter um, as, as we've noted here. So the key services that we do provide um, is coming from the itinerant teacher. And um, one is what we call direct service. And basically direct service, depending on the student and the various factors that we consider, um, it, we decide how much time that itinerant teacher will give the student throughout the week. And the support can be provided in the classroom or in a one-on-one -on -one setting, um, determined as on a case-by-case -case basis. And the, at these particular times, these are the, 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 the itinerant teachers are teaching areas, what we call the expanded core curriculum, so specific skills, but also ensuring that they have appropriate access to the classroom setting. But in the, these particular students would also have a program developed with outcomes in place that they would be following, in addition to the general curriculum that they're following in school. 
We also have uh, consultative services. So these would be students who um, we would visit, we would work with maybe on a monthly basis. Um, in most cases, these students are either functioning very well in, in, their, in their, their setting and using their vision well, they have everything in order, or they may be students with additional exceptionalities. And we really, the key there is working with the team to ensure um, everything is in place for that student. So your, your service is more focused on the people around the student rather than the student. For the last few years, we've also been providing some distance services. And um, of course, since COVID came in, you, you, you realize the value of that, but it's been ongoing for us uh, for a number of reasons. A couple of reasons is um, the geography, because we're in the four provinces, geography is quite huge. And sometimes there is a demand with itinerant services, a shortage of, of uh, itinerant services. So someone may be providing services. And also, depending on geography, as I said, it's the inability to provide the service in person as consistently as um, you'd like. So we were doing it in um, through the distance services component. And again, that's decided on an individual basis and in consultation with the school team. Um, in addition to the itinerant teacher services you're getting, there are other specialists that we have um, for students who are blind or visually impaired. I actually want to point out as well, in, in, at, at APSI, we provide support to students who are blind or visually impaired and also students who are deaf or hard of hearing. And um, but our focus today is on students who are blind or visually impaired. If you go to our website, you'll see that information. Um, and also, we have uh, some support for students under the autism spectrum. That particular area is more about providing professional learning opportunities to people who work with students um, under the autism umbrella. And uh, you can access their information on our website as well. But just going back quickly to our students who are blind and visually impaired, in addition to the itinerant teacher, you see here we have preschool supports, we have assistive technology support, counseling transition and orientation and mobility. So these are some areas that we target that are critical um, for the students on our caseload. And um, we just have highlighted and provided extra support to the itinerant teacher, to the school team, to ensure the student is developing as we would like. And here are others, occupational therapist, short-term program, teacher of functional learning, functional vision learning media, uh, psychologist, augmentative and alternative communication. And we also have a resource service where we provide the titles, the students, what students are using in the school, we put it in an alternate format and we, we can prepare that at the center. So all of these particular areas, I won't get into in detail, but we do have an extensive amount of support that we can provide to students, um, all in consultation with that school team. So that's just kind of a quick nutshell of what we do and how, um, how we operate. Um, but I wanna spend some time just talking in general about individuals who are blind or visually impaired. And first of all, if you look at this, you see I have down myth or fact. And just to think about these, the first one, um, and these are some interesting, these are things that we hear over, over and over again, and um, just wanted to have a few minutes to comment to these. People who are blind have a sixth sense. People who are blind only see blackness or grayness. People who are blind need to be spoken for. So these are actually all myths. And um, I think pretty self, some of them are easy, self-explanatory. But the second one about only see blackness or grayness, it depends on how um, the person is seeing. So when we say blind, it is their, their vision is very, very limited, minimal. And so it's not just complete blackness. They may be able to see um, some shades or whatnot. And so it varies. So when you hear someone saying they are blind, you don't make the assumption they all are seeing or not seeing the same way. Here are others people who are blind are easily able to recognize a person by just hearing the person's voice. People who are blind have better than average musical abilities. And when speaking with people who are visually impaired, never use terms as see or look to refer to specific colors or refer to specific colors. Again, these are all myths. 
And the top one about hearing the person's voice, it, it is true that the individuals would recognize your voice, but the key is to identify yourself before you speak to a person. Otherwise, they're taking a lot of time to, to figure out they're spinning in their brain, I know this voice, but who is it right now? Especially if the voice is out of a context from where they typically would be. Um, in terms of the musical abilities, not necessarily the case. It just, they tend to have that, they tend to be as an interest of theirs, um, but it's not because they are blind that they have that interest. They just happen to be musically inclined. And we use the language look, see, and refer to colors on a regular basis. And often our students, when they say, can I see that? It depends on how they're using. So I have a student who is um, blind and very much a braille, completely blind and uses braille. And when we're doing something, she'll say, can I, can I see that? So when she's looking to see something, she's actually taking her hands and using her hands to see it. But she's seeing it from the way she sees everything, which is tactile for her. So these are just some other points I wanted to make up there. And then thinking about um, vision and the role it plays in our world, here are just some important points. 80 to 85% of what we know is learned through vision. And 75 to 90 is in the classroom, comes through the visual system. And if you just take a minute to reflect on that, you can see um, that you know that vision is a big part of our world. Um, we also know it can have an impact on learning and development. And there are some studies that show that children with low vision um, may, could possibly be behind. They're typically developing peers regarding reading speed, accuracy, and comprehension. So that is some things that you may come up with. And also, um, children who struggle to read in the very early grades are less likely to remain at grade level in the rest of their academic subjects. Um, and that I think is comparable to all students. But the point is that vision does have an impact. And just think for yourself, you know, how much we use our vision and something as simple as walking into a room. So think about yourselves now, right now you're at this academy online. In previous years, it was in person. And when you walked into a session, the very first thing you're gathering information and you think about how quickly, that's in seconds that you're gathering information about what the room looks like, the setup of the room, who's in the room, are there people that you know, what are people doing, you know, is there somewhere you can sit, um, can, is there a space next to the people you know you can sit with, are the tables round, or is it, how is the, everything set up, is there coffee, or whatnot, and when you think that, you've, take, you've gathered that information in a very, very short period of time, so when we have individuals who are blind or visually impaired, that's information that they're not getting because vision is giving them so much information. And so just something for you to reflect on, how much we use our vision to get around in the world. Um, so I'm going to show you a picture just to kind of give you a little bit of a simulation. <clears throat> because another really important point is um, if an individual is blind or visually impaired, especially visually impaired, it doesn't mean that they all see the same way. Depending on the eye condition, it could vary. And even if the students have the same eye condition, it still could be different. So it's important to remember that. So if you have a student in your classroom who is visually impaired, having a good sense of what that student, how they access their vision, use their vision is very, very critical for you in terms of planning and preparing to provide support to the student in the classroom. So the picture I'm going to show you, I just want you to look at it for a second. And the question is, how many boats are in the picture? Okay, so here though is a picture. This is a, an individual who may have some blind spots or cataracts. So when you're looking at this, and, and we know in our in the education system, we do rely on vision. There are a lot of visual graphs, visual images that we use because that is a big component of learning for individuals. So here is an example. So you're looking at how many boats. Now here is the actual picture. And when you look at this picture, I'm seeing four boats. I'm seeing two very close in front. Um, to the right of one boat, there is 
just looks like a little speedboat or something or something. And then to the left, in the back, you see another sailboat. So in this picture, there are actually four boats. Just to go back for a second to the picture before, you look here, you might have seen three. So if you have a student in your classroom who was given that picture and they got the, the answer incorrect, it was really because they could not see what was on the picture. So here is, again, the picture, but here's another example. So the same picture with another type of vision loss. This is one with decreased visual acuity. This is how they might gather the information. And when you look at this one, you may or may not get those two smaller boats on each side of the bigger sailboats. Depends on how decreased their uh, visual acuity is. And this one, you have central vision is impacted. So when you're looking at that one, you're... I'm maybe seeing two boats. I'm not sure what you're seeing, but as you can see, it's impacted. And then you have a visual field loss. And again, this student with visual field loss could come up with a different answer than others. So I thought it important just to highlight those, um, just those pictures I find are very helpful to give you a sense for how the student sees. So as we're talking in this session about literacy um, for students who are blind or visually impaired, um, sometimes it's not as much about the, the learning part, but it's getting them, giving them access to the information. And so um, I think I'm passing this over to Nellie. And um, just remember the point that every child sees differently. And so how do we go about that? And one of the key points is ensuring they have access. So I'll just take it from here. Um, so as Glenda was saying, every child sees differently. So it doesn't, um, their visual impairment doesn't necessarily tell us exactly what they're going to be able to see. So we need to learn more about the child, how they're functioning in the classroom, how they're actually accessing the information, and then how we can actually support uh, their access. So for example, going back to the boats, we might actually have to do some talking about the picture and pointing out some of the details to them so they actually realize that there's four boats in that picture, that there's two larger boats and that there's two smaller boats in the background. So some of that is how we support the access or even as a teacher that you can support the access. If it's going to be cr critical that they see those four boats, we might actually have to point it out to them so that they can actually see the salient details and be able to differentiate even the white against the blue um, in order to um, gain the information and be able to respond to the questions correctly. So we're gonna move from here to a slide about the itinerant teacher. So the itinerant teachers are those teachers who are, as Glenda had said earlier, they are part of the school-based team and they generally have a very strong understanding of the curriculum and they understand um, how things are being taught. However, the classroom teacher is actually the person who um, knows the teaching and knows the curriculum really well and is the one who is doing the teaching and the itinerant teacher comes in to support because they want the child to be active participants in their learning that's taking place. So they'll work really closely with the classroom teacher in order to make sure that there is access for the students. And as we continue on, um, I'll talk more about how we can support the access um, as we go. So one of the things that itinerant teachers do that sometimes we maybe don't explain well enough is that they spend time observing in the classroom and the reason why they spend a lot of time observing is because they're trying to get a sense of how is the student actually seeing what are they doing to be able to see the information so if you think of the picture of the boats is it that the child is moving in really close do we see that the child is maybe moving their head from left to right or right to left and, and in order to be able to see all the parts and pieces of that picture. So the itinerant teacher will spend time 
trying to sort out the functional vision and how the child is using that in order to learn. And we call that a functional vision learning media assessment. So the itinerant teacher spends time in the classroom with the typical materials being used in the classroom, watching the student maybe asking questions. So they're validating what the actual vision loss is and trying to um, provide support to the classroom teachers. So then they offer recommendations um, about their environment. So for example, it could be a really simple um, recommendation. It could be something like, well, there's a lot of glare in this classroom. So if we close the blinds, that will make it easier for this particular child to be able to see. Or when you're writing on the whiteboard, using black markers is really helpful. Or it could be more complex in the sense of, well, this child is having a really hard time reading their own writing, or it's taking a really long time for them to write because they're trying to stay on a really light blue line that they can barely see. So being able to support them to learn touch typing might be a recommendation that um, gets made. So those are some of the ways that as itinerant teachers, we work within the classroom with the classroom teacher because the classroom teacher really and truly um, can help give a lot of information to the itinerants. And then when they make recommendations, the uh, itinerant teachers try as much as possible to only make the accommodations that are necessary. So on the slide here, it says only as special as necessary. And that's where working with the classroom teacher, so um, collaborating with the classroom teacher becomes very, very important because the classroom teacher sees the child for every day, for all the hours that the child is in school. So they have a lot of information that the itinerant teacher um, can benefit from. So that's why having conversations with the classroom teacher is really important. And we all realize classroom teachers are extremely busy and sometimes it might be hard to find the time to um, talk to the itinerant teacher. However, just being able to schedule some time to talk to the itinerant teacher really helps support the student. So that, for example, on this slide, it's talking about the accommodations. So for a younger student, Generally, the print size, what we refer to as primary print, is large enough for the child to be able to access it. So generally, the print tends to get smaller at around grade four, and also the amount of text on the page and the complexity on the page is grade four is where we're seeing that big transition. So an itinerant teacher may not make any recommendations to change the print size at a younger grade. Another way that we can help provide access is through assistive technology. So um, itinerant teachers work closely with the uh, um, assistive technology um, specialist at APSI, and they determine what type of assistive technology will be helpful for the child. And the purpose of the assistive technology is really to be able to gain access. So for example, they might be able to have a device that they have on their desk, so they can be able to see what's on the smart board or what's on the whiteboard, and it just brings it closer to them in order to um, help that they can just stay in their desk where they are instead of having to move forward. Then we talk about large print and enlarged print. Now, we talk about this later on. Large print and enlarged print is not necessarily accessible later on in life. So relying a lot on large print or in large print is not necessarily beneficial. Using technology is much, much more beneficial for the student because it helps them um, foster independence. And as we know, the 21st century competencies um, using technology as a huge piece of 21st century learning and being able to access technology, being able to use it independently, being able to be part of group work or whatever they're doing and being able to use that technology is uh, really helpful. So go ahead, Glenda, we can move on. 
So going on to the next slide. So here's some just some other basic um, accommodations. Actually, if you back up one slide, Linda, sorry. So just some of the basic accommodations. Um, itinerant teachers will have conversations with you about some of these things. So for example, a reading stand is one of the accommodations that we recommend, especially for younger students. Um, because what it helps do is it helps bring that printed material closer to the child. Instead of the child having to lean down really close to be able to see their work, they can put their work on the reading stand and be able to see it. Um, frequent breaks is something that we talk about and that classroom teachers can help support. If, um, <clears throat> excuse me, if students are doing a lot of reading or writing, and a lot of visual tasks, they might need a break. Uh, appropriate lighting, we talk about a lot. Preferential seating is when we um, are in the classroom and we help sort out where the child should be sitting in order to see the information. Um, I, did, I noticed that one of the participants had commented about um, the child needing to know where the person is if they're farther away than one or two meters. So preferential seating is the same sort of thing. If this particular child is, you know, sitting beyond three meters away, they might not be able to see what you're talking about or what you're referring to. So having them move closer, being in that range that they can use their vision to their optimal um, is, is helpful. Glare is huge. Um, glare is all over the place, but in classrooms, especially if there's a lot of windows, it can be uh, an issue, especially smart boards is a huge issue, whiteboards. And what I often uh, suggest is that people just crouch down to the level that the child is at and suddenly you see glare from their perspective. Because sometimes as an adult, what we're looking at or the angle we're looking at things, we might not pick up on the same level of glare as the child does. So getting down to their level helps us pick up on the glare and why they're actually not seeing what you wrote on the whiteboard, for example, even though you were using that black marker that had been suggested to use. So then we have um, just a little tip sheet about some of the things that um, classroom teachers can easily keep in mind when working with students who are blind or visually impaired. So some of the things is providing visual access. So for example, the things that I just talked about, having an optimal uh, listening environment because uh, people who are blind, visually impaired do uh, rely on what they hear in order to um, augment what they're seeing. Having an expectation that the students use their assistive technology device is very helpful. Um, because the itinerant teacher can't be in the classroom all the time. If the classroom teacher is supporting those um, levels of independence, it's crucial for lifelong learning. Having the seating arrangement we talked about, using descriptive language. So um, sometimes, and I sometimes even can be vague in how I describe things. So sometimes just being really specific, I want you to put your reading, your reading material on the back table in the right hand corner something like that so that the student is eliminating all the guesswork and not kind of standing at the table going oh is this the right table uh, where am i supposed to put it there's three stacks of paper um do i put it here or does it go off here so just being really specific and that's also even when you're teaching um being really specific when you're teaching information can really help um, and I think, let's see, I'm just quickly skimming, just providing copies of notes and handouts can be really helpful, especially in their, for the student's preferred format, providing descriptions, um, providing electronic copies of information, that's really crucial, especially if students are older and using a laptop, uh, having that accessible format for uh, electronic copies is really helpful so that they can use it and, and read the information and have the alt text uh, embedded to, um, in descriptions to help them understand what's being presented. 
and um, just having the same visual access to the peers that um, their peers have so that they gain the same information or they gain the same access to the information that's being presented. Okay. Yeah. And, and that's why um, one of the reasons we really try and encourage the itinerant teachers to be working in the classroom with the student because there is a lot of information going on in the classroom that's valuable to all students. And so um, that's kind of when, it, when Nellie was talking about this particular form, it came to my mind. And the other one I think that is important is that really important is the being descriptive. We're so we're so quick to say, oh, it's over there, the, over there. And where is that? Like so being more specific about those details is very critical. And um, it it takes it doesn't it doesn't take much to get used to, but it's a good practice for all students when you think about it. But it's it's very valuable for a student. It gives you that universal access piece that we're always talking about. So I think it's back to me, Nelly. Uh yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um so as you can see, up to this point, we're talking about access. And in truth, as we've said, both of us have alluded to, it is such a critical component. And at the end of the day, if the student has the appropriate access, that may be the only thing you need to think about because then they can continue on like everyone else in the classroom and whatever learning is going on, they're able to access it. So it can be as you would, as you would basically continue on. So when we talk about literacy, and I have this page here, and of course, every one of us here could come up with many different ways to define what literacy is, but you know, we know that it's not just kind of reading and writing. We know it's it's all inclusive. It, you know, it's not just the written word. There's problem solving in there. It's thinking about the 21st century, all the tools that you can have access to. And um, just really, it's, it's very inclusive. There's a lot to it. And we know that. So it's very important to be aware of that. And these are some of the major competencies that we've come up with working with a variety of technology, identification, organization, planning, allocation resources, working with others, acquiring and using information, and understanding complex interrelationships. So these are some critical competencies with the literacy. And when you look at these, you can see how, you know, when we talk about access, you see that embedded in all of these to ensure the student who's blind or visually impaired is able to move forward. Um, so I'm just going to dig, though, going from the literacy, and I'm going to target reading specifically right now, because we know that the reading part is, you know, is critical for everyone. And, you know, as we see, it's understanding the meaning of symbols, print, or tactile medium, because we may, you may have, there may be students in the classroom who have low vision, visually impaired, so they're print users. So their access would be using electronic devices, but print is what they use. But you also would have students who may be braille users, so they're they're tactile, and it's it's um it's a critical. No matter what, whether it's print or braille, it's still reading. It's just a different medium. So many people may confuse uh, and think that braille is a language. Braille is not a language. Braille is a code, and it is used um, for individuals to access the written word, basically in a tactile. And as we all know, here are the areas that have significant impact on reading development. And these early childhood experiences are huge, which is why we put a focus um, for students who are blind and visually impaired. We give it a really strong focus. You know, there's research out that we know from birth to five, it's critical for everyone. Um, but you need to really have some intentional time in place for a child who is blind or visually impaired to build that skill. It's really interesting. I have a new grandson. He is four months old. And, you know, when my granddaughter came along as well, we're constantly assessing, which I think is what educators do naturally. But for me, just watching and and this little, little guy is, like I said, four months old and how much information he's picking up from the vision and all of the different experiences we're trying to give him. Like he enjoys going outside, sitting on the steps with my with my father and listening to the leaves and the rustling. So we're talking to him about, oh, can you hear the leaves rustling in the wind? So we're using all of that language and we know how critical that is. And if you're blind or visually impaired, it's essential because 
they're not picking it up from that visual piece either. So it's very, very important. So early childhood is critical. And here are the areas that also we know, phonemic awareness, awareness, sorry, phonics, reading fluency, vocab, reading comprehension. These are some areas of reading that are critical for all students, but we try and target these specifically for the students um, to ensure they don't miss information. And other factors, of course, it's the oral language, memory, prior knowledge, and attention and focus. So all of these um, impact, you know, the, the progress. So the more experience you can give individuals, the children, the better. And because that vision is not, is missing at some capacity for the students, you can't make the assumption they're gathering the information because we do learn that like incidental learning just naturally. You know, if you're sitting at the table, you have a little, little person there, um, they eventually figure out, oh, this is the tool that I use to stir something in my cup, or this is what I use to pick up food. So you may use the language, but if you didn't say anything, they can pick that up. Whereas if a student is blind or vision impaired, you have to ensure those components are there. Um, then we have Of our processing skills and, um, because they, they do rely on that more they'll you know it's that idea you know sometimes you'll hear people say oh people who are visually impaired or blind their hearing is better well their hearing is not necessarily better it's just they use the other remaining senses more so they're picking up that and you know the students who are blind especially you, you sit back and it's incredible how much they are relying on their hearing to gather information and so, but these skills all impact that whole process. And again, we don't need to get into this conversation too much, but we know how important it is we need to be able to read. It's a fundamental skill and it, it gives you that independence and freedom to, um, to basically look, to move such that once you're in a position, you can actually be successful and independent in society and hopefully gain employment. So it is critical. And it's, it's interesting because there's always conversation about, um, you know, why do you need to learn Braille if there are, um, there's so much auditory out there now, like you can use all of these devices and it can talk to you. Well, basic, it is critical because it's basically, we would never take print away from an individual. Um, you know, if you, if you have a student who is typically functioning, um, you know, from that regular typical cognitive level, we would expect them to be reading. So why would it be different? And it was just about two weeks ago, this popped up on my Twitter page. And it just, I took a picture of it because it really got my attention. And it says, while Braille is literacy, it is so much more. It's access to literature, to math, to music, and to signage in our environment. As a result, Braille becomes the bridge to full inclusion and independence in our society. And this was a quote from one of the executive directors at Perkins School for the Blind. She's a Braille user herself, but it just got my attention and it kind of captured that whole um, everything about the conversations you may hear about why bother to learn Braille. So it's just, I just thought it quite interesting. I thought I'd pop that in there and share with you in the group. Is this still me, Nellie? I think so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, we're going back and forth. So the question is, for reading for students who are blind and visually impaired, is it the same or is it different? And basically, it's the same. It's basically the same. Um, and when you think about for everybody, it's the same areas of the brain being accessed, right? All the areas of being um being used to to get the functioning and even for visual and tactile learners however there is research to show that there are other components of the brain being used for it so when you have a student who is a braille user um it may be a little more complex they're learning the, they're, they're learning their the reading and writing process but there's almost another layer it's triggering but that's what they know so it's it's for them it's just picking it up but it's just that extra piece that's being used but in general 
it is the same, right? And of course, we need to make sure there's support. Um, there may be a need though for some direct intensive instruction for the students just to ensure, as Nellie was talking about the pictures, um, you may need to take the time to give the student the chance to analyze that picture and, and they have a real good look at what's there um, and, and specifically highlight things going on around. So it's always that intentional teaching um, because of the fact that incidental learning you know, we just pick up, but we can't assume the student is getting the information. When I think about the core curriculum in the school system and all the different areas of development, you know, like the social development, the, um, I'm just, just trying to think of different ones, but all the different areas, it's all embedded in the curriculum and it's, it just kind of it happens as you're teaching, but much of it, you may just have to pop out and make a point of focusing a little bit more for a student who is blind or visually impaired. So as a classroom teacher, it's just being aware of that and reflecting on that, just kind of how might that, how might I look at that for the student in my classroom who's blind, or how might I look at that for a student in my classroom who's visually impaired? So it's just being aware. And I think if you do that, it has value. And I always say as a classroom teacher, it's helpful to everybody in the classroom when I'm looking at it in this, this format. So I'm giving everybody access in an inappropriate way. And of course, um, there can be consequences if we're not giving all of that support, right? There can be some delay and complete. Um, there's, um, they may not understand printed word. They may not have as much exposure or access to written text in their environment. And of course, for the Braille readers, limited access to uh, this medium to practice reading skills. So there are some consequences when you are blind or visually impaired. So at the end of the day, students who are blind or visually impaired acquire reading skills in the same manner as their peers. It's not different, but they may require a little bit of intentional and intensive direct teaching. That's the only difference because of some of those pieces of information they may miss because of their vision. And one example comes in my mind very quickly. I remember two students in grade 12, I think, we were looking at these electronic assistive technology devices they could be using for um, them to gather information. I think it was math specifically. And one commented how useful it would be because she misses the negative sign before a number a lot. And the other one commented that she misses out on the exponents that are there. So there, these were very high, you know, high-end, probably top five or six in the class for their academic levels and not scoring where they could be. And it wasn't because they didn't understand the concepts, it was because they were missing the information from that visual perspective. And so they just needed that support. Um, you know, even if a teacher is talking out, just making sure all of that is there. Um, so that's where you, you know, you could do that intentional, just making sure they've gathered all that information, they haven't missed it, and it's because of the visual piece. So for you as a class, I'm, I'm, I don't know if you're a classroom teacher here, but if as a classroom teacher, it's knowing that the curriculum you have in place for these students, it's the same. And that's that's a critical point here that we wanted to highlight, that it it is the same as the other peers, just a little couple of extra things to put in place. It's not a completely different concept. And it's that's why it's not necessary for an itinerant teacher to take the student out and do that as a separate thing. It could be going on in the classroom. So that's the key message that I wanted to point out there. Um, and just a couple of other points about Braille students in, in particular. Um, they do tend to read the Braille alphabet later. Um, than learning it in print. Um, but what that means is from that tactile perspective, it may be a little longer. They may understand the letters of the alphabet and be able to say them auditorily and whatnot, but the tactile may take a little bit longer. Um, and also they do uh, tend to be good though with phonemic awareness. And in the Braille code, I think there are some components of the Braille code that reinforce that. So it, it tends to help a bit there. Is this still me, Nelly? So no, I take over. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> okay, so um, going back to 
print readers. Um, Gwen, did you have your mic on still? Yep. Okay. If you, maybe because we're just getting a lot of feedback, so maybe if you turn your mic off and then okay. go ahead to the slide that you were on, actually, Glenda. Sorry. So okay, talking well, about just talking about print readers and um we'll just um some of the symbols when we're looking at um some of the common symbols that are easy to confuse in print it's um really easy to confuse certain letters for so think back to those pictures where we were looking at the boats because that's just such a, a a great way to explain some of these common symbols that are confused. So for example, an H and a B, if you have decreased visual acuity, you may not be seeing the differences between an H and a B. So somebody might be attempting to read something and it's not because they don't know that an H is an H and a B is a B, but when they're actually looking at it in the context of a word, they may not be able to visually discriminate that difference as easy as someone who um, has uh, good vision, so to speak. So then looking at the one that always strikes me is the M. And so if you look at the right hand column, the second um, example on the right hand column. So you have an M and then you have an R and an N. And when the R and the N are typed really or typed together, they can look like an M, and actually it's two separate letters. So again, the child might know all the letters of the alphabet, but when they're put together like that, they may read it as an M, and it can cause confusion for that child. O's, C's, Q's, G's, another, they're all very, very challenging for um, people with decreased acuity or other vision challenges to be able to discriminate. So sometimes even going over key vocabulary can be a really good way um, to point out some of those salient differences for the child. So another thing is when they're looking at text, sometimes we have headings that are in different colors, maybe light blue sometimes is the trend lately is the, the light blue color. That can be very hard to discriminate. So that's just an added layer to their literacy that makes it more challenging for them to understand the information. And yet when it's pointed out to them, so for example, if somebody says, oh, we're looking at this top heading at the very top of the page, and it says print readers with vision loss, then they know, oh, that's what that says. And it takes them less energy to be able to discriminate all the information that's there. So we can go on to the next slide, Glenda. And so just some final points. Glenda had pointed some of this out, but I'm just going to reiterate it. So the classroom teacher has a really critical role to play because the classroom teacher really and truly is teaching all of the components of literacy because that is what classroom teachers are really skilled at is being able to teach the literacy components and just knowing some of the access challenges just helps support that classroom teacher to maybe present things um, a little bit differently or to keep in mind some of the challenges that um, students may face. And as Glenda mentioned, it's not just for the students who have visual impairments, but for everyone in that classroom. So it's not you don't necessarily have to see it as all these extra things that we're doing, but really that universal design for learning um, is just really supportive for all the students. So reading development is the same for all the students and um, vision will impact the ability to access the information. So for example, um, they may not have seen certain things. For example, I worked with a child who didn't have a clue what a flagpole was, even though he walked past that flagpole for two years before it came up in a story, and he was completely confused, had no clue what the teacher was talking about. So we actually spent time and we went outside and with the principal, we actually lowered the flag, raised the flag, listened to the flag flapping in the wind, 
And suddenly when we went back and read that story, you could just see all the connecting points for that student. It's like, ah, now this story makes sense because they just didn't understand that concept because they didn't experience what a flagpole was, what a flag was and all of that. So they just didn't understand the story because that visual access was so limited. So moving on, we are going to take a look at the Braille code. So we have a few minutes. So this is the Braille code. It is made of um, six dots, so to speak, and the combination of how we use those dots makes up the basic alphabet and then um, what we call contractions or short forms of words um, is all from the six dots of uh, the Braille code. So we are going to do an activity. And actually, what I'll do is I'll turn on my camera. And so, so yeah, so we have this activity that you have the actual um, Braille. And you can, if you want, you can just write it or you can, somebody can um, type it into the chat to tell us what the word is. So has anyone figured out what the first word is? Excellent, right, snow. And I, I have to be patient because of course we look at the braille and, and we're, we can be fairly quick in seeing what it says. However, for some of you, um, it's it's more challenging because you're looking at it letter for letter. So how about the next um, the next word? Can anyone figure out what it is? Excellent. So we've got a, a Braille champion here. So good. Um, so we're doing this visually. Of course, students who are actually reading Braille do this tactually. There's uh, lots of skills involved in teaching them um, the acquisition of the Braille code. But um, as Glenda said, it's a code and they can access the materials that are being presented um, using that code. So just for the sake of time, Glenda, I'm wondering if we should just quickly skim through the next ones. So these were just all activities that we were going to have you do. If you, if you want, um, I can show you my, I just quickly, I don't know if you could see my screen, if Glenda is sharing her screen, but you can actually just use the Braille code to, um, uh, to write your name and so on. Okay, so we're almost at the end of our session. So thank you so much for joining us.